we have people begin by going to Juarez and observing and learning about the conditions there and then we'll bring them back to El Paso and we'll take them to a shelter that works with um, undocumented immigrants, people who are in the country illegally and we'll hear their story which is typically the story that they've just observed across the border that we're poor people who can't find a job that feeds our family in Mexico and so their story is that they had pretty much no option but to come to the United States to look for work. I was driving with my family from San Diego to Albuquerque and in the road we found families, migrant families or workers who were without any any money to buy gas to continue their, their journey. We'll take people across the border to Juarez where they will see how people live. Sometimes people are are working full-time for a U.S. company that has relocated into Ciudad Juarez and, um, and though they're working full-time the wages are so low that there's they still may literally be living in a house made of cardboard. We recognize that the times have changed. This isn't the Wild West. We're not just a bunch of cowboys out here having fun hooping and hollering and shooting our six-shooters up in the air. For those of you that have never been here, welcome to the southern border. Traditionally, you're not going to climb this fence the way you would climb the way you would climb a traditional fence, like a chain link fence. There's just no foothold for that. So you're going to have to use some type of a device, whether it's a rope ladder, whatever it may be. Am I saying that you can't penetrate this fence? No. This fence can be penetrated, just like anything. But what it does do is it provides us with time. Plus, it allows our agents that might be on the other side of the fence to see their threat. That's the other aspect that many people don't realize. This fence, because it limits the amount of traffic coming through, it's providing our agents with some type of officer safety. That safety allows for our agents to have to deal with fewer people and less likelihood of danger. Again, you're not going to have somebody drive through this fence and at you. They're not going to run their car towards you. But uh, if you have a group of 10 people and they do decide to try it, even if you've got a rope ladder, the amount of upper, upper body strength required to pull yourself up through the rope ladder is uh, it's a pretty good amount that you need. So not everyone physically is going to be able to do it. Now, for those that might be able to do it, still going to take you longer again than it would to try to get through a chain link fence. To me and to, and to my family it was a contradiction that the migrant farm workers are the ones that produce the food to sustain humanity, to sustain society, but very often they don't have anything to eat, they don't have any jobs, they don't have any income and nothing to feed their kids, the family. So uh, it was uh, something unfair, especially because it's happening in the United States, the richest country in the world. And it ha it's happening to the workers, uh, the human beings, who are the foundation of our food system. In 1977, we decided to volunteer to give our services to this farm worker group based in the Rio Grande Valley in South Texas. It was something, you know, that we wanted to uh, to be involved with. And, you know, there was, you know, a sense that that uh, that we wanted to to help rescue the dignity of the workers and to in one way or another, whether it's small or big, to give our uh, our contribution. This is the largest well, metropolitan area that covers two two countries anywhere in the in the world. But if you focus on on putting barriers in place to make it difficult for people to come come across, it can affect business and or the you know the transfer of 
of all business across the border. Now, if we focus on the other side, if we focus on just the commercial aspect of it, you know, we might miss those people coming in that pose a threat to the United States. That's the balance. So we have to make sure that we do things in a, in a smart and sensible way using technology to determine who we need to spend more time on. The word puente means bridge in Spanish. Well, there's a, uh, many walls and fences. We're spending hundreds of millions of dollars um, building new walls and fences and hiring new border patrol agents here on the U.S.-Mexico border. It's our belief that uh, there are, certainly there are problems here. We're going to have to work in collaboration with Mexico to solve these problems, which are common problems. And so we'd like to present the image of a bridge rather than walls as far as how we go about solving these problems. And because the river was always moving around, you wound up getting a mix of different habitats over time. This was the international boundary at that time. And Mexico was right over there. And, and we pretty much lost that real important part of the natural heritage of this region with all these changes in the valley. So we're trying to bring a little bit of that back here at Real Bosque. And we've been working at it for the last 11 years, trying to reestablish at least an approximation of the mix of native habitats, the native plant and animal communities that once were found in the river valley. The Mequiladoras are basically uh, factories that are built in, on the Mexican side of the border. And that way we, we can divide maybe high cost labor activities and manufacturing um, and, and, and we can export those to Mexico and then, and then Mexico can export the final product. Uh, to the United States. For many years they, they get, often get tax benefits uh, for locating close to the border. Of course, maquiladoras are being hurt significantly due to a lot of what, what's going on in Juarez and in other parts of, of the northern border. So we're not separating families, but it's amazing to hear how people might think that we should have open borders, especially when you've got people from Mexico saying so. When, if you look at their their borders uh, on the south side. They have very, very strict and stringent rules uh, to enter their country. If you're from El Salvador or Honduras, good luck. They're extremely strict and very violent at times and brutal when it comes to enforcing their laws. Believe me, I've apprehended people from those other Central American countries and to hear the stories that they have, the horror stories of how they've been beat, mugged, raped, robbed, had to pay their tolls three or four times along the way just to be able to get this far. It's scary to hear. And you think to yourself, you know, you think our laws are, are tough. We're trying to do this in as much of a civil manner as possible while enforcing our laws. But while the, one country may be clamoring and saying, hey, let's have this open border policy, that's not what they're exercising on the southern border. And their southern border is, that in many ways can be considered a war zone and it's brutal. It's a brutal fight just to try to get into the country. So I'm not at all uh, disappointed with how we enforce our laws because I know we try to treat everybody humanely. You can read about illegal immigration, you can watch videos about illegal immigration, but the chance to observe the conditions that folks come from in Mexico and then to sit down and have a meal with a person who has literally snuck across the border and now is contemplating his or her next move is something you can probably only get here. In a foreign place Watch them turn to foreigners Right before your face Oh my babe I wanna go home Oh